Okay, well, uh, let's just bow together and pray. Lord, we're grateful that we can come together this evening for Rooted. We thank you for your people, your church, the way you have led your people down through the ages. And we pray that tonight as we think about some of the people in the early days of the church and some of the things that they talked about, that you would guide us, that we'd have understand uh, the basic drift of what was happening and also see some relevance for our lives today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, we've got some new markers, so I'm... Can everybody see that? Can you see that? Uh, it's not the greatest, eh? Okay. Well, um, I put up a couple words here, and one is the word heresy. And... Um, Yeah. We're, what we need is we need a white background, and, and uh, DJ's going to get his paintbrush out, he says, and do that. This one doesn't really. Then I'll try one of the other ones. These are, these are new, but I'll try one of these then and see what that's like. Okay, let's try this. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Now we're in business. Okay. This will never come off. But anyway, there it is. Okay, well, one of the developments that we see in the early church is the growth of heresy. Uh, a writer named Harold O.J. Brown, uh, not too long ago, pointed out that words get turned around in their meaning. And so virtuous conveys to some people a person who is correct, but might also be kind of cold and aloof. Sinner, on the other hand, might sound kind of exciting to some people. Now, we have some of these words, and they may have certain connotations. So heretic... Um, in terms of the church and in terms of Christianity, we think of that as something not so good, uh, a deviation, but you know that sometimes a heretic kind of gets used to, well, he was a heretic, like he's a, an adventuresome guy, you know, he's uh, on the cutting edge. So people read their meanings into these things. But the word um, orthodox, and think of something like um, orthopedic, it means right or straight. Um, so it's the straight way to go. Heresy is kind of deviating off the path. And um, it comes from a, a word in Greek that means a choice and a party, like a group dedicated to certain ideas. Heretics are people who carve out their own path they choose a line that is different from that of the uh, majority who are orthodox. Um, they form a new party, a group within the church that um, goes its own way, at least to some extent or in some area. Now, the interesting thing about heresy in the history of Christianity is that in God's providence, the fact of there being heretics, people who went off the usual path, often forced the rest of the church to think a little deeper about what they believed and to write it down and, and formulate it. So, um, for example, Scripture gives us raw material for many of the things we believe. Um, I don't know if you've thought about this much, but... When you go to the Bible, like it's not a textbook on theology. It's not like it says, you know, Trinity, and then you get five pages that explain the Trinity. It's that you get little hints and pieces and bits here and there that point us to God being one God in what we say are three persons. Um, it just gives you kind of the raw materials. So that, for example, we know that God is one. There is one God. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. That's foundational for the Hebrew people. And yet, you find some Jewish people in the early, uh, the first century, uh, who are saying, yes, of course, God is one, but there's something else going on here. We've met this man, Jesus, and he has made certain claims that he can forgive people's sins. Only God can do that. Uh, He has said things like, you know, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Before Abraham was, I am, which is the name of God. A lot of things that point to Jesus being also God on the level with the Father. And then there are some hints here and there of the Holy Spirit. So, for example, in Acts, uh, if you remember uh, Acts chapter 5, you have Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, this was the couple, and they said uh, people were, were, were giving up property or selling things to help out the poor. And they said, oh yes, we've sold everything, and we're giving it to uh, distribute to the needy. And Peter said, no, you haven't. Uh, You've held back some of it. And it wasn't that they were holding back. They didn't have to give it all. It was that they lied. And he said, you have uh, lied to the Holy Spirit. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And a few verses later, you have not lied to men or humans, but to God. Put the two together, you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. Holy Spirit is God. So there are lots of raw materials that you can put, the, put it together if you think about it. Um, but the New Testament doesn't put all the pieces together for us to form a coherent teaching that's thoughtfully formulated that says something like God exists eternally in three persons and yet one God, um, one essence or substance, something like that. Uh, That came later when people sat down and came up with these these technical terms like person or essence or substance and um, and kind of formulated a, a teaching about it. But when the heretics challenged the orthodox understanding, especially when they reduced the Son of God to a lesser being, a created being, um, then what happened was the church was prodded into action to then really define more carefully what it believed. Does anybody, that makes sense to people? So uh, you just sort of, sort of almost take for granted some of the things that you believe. And then somebody comes along and says, yeah, but Jesus is not equal to God. He is on the, on the next level down. He's created by the Father. And you say, wait a minute. No, that's not right. And then you have to think about formulating how Jesus relates to the Father. Um, so in, a, in an odd way, we owe a kind of debt to the heretics because they forced us, us, I mean the mainstream of the church, the Orthodox, to work out uh, more clearly the basics of the faith. Now, there are some different uh, groups that you find, we might call them, we might say they were heretics, in the early days of Christianity, and I'll put up some, uh, what did I do with mine? Eraser. Um, by the way, um, DJ, when you do the painting, I want a real eraser. Okay. Um, get that too. Put it on the bill. Send it to the deacons. So one group is the uh, Nazarenes. Now, this is not the Church of the Nazarene, um, who are sort of like Methodists, uh, but it's a term used by, uh, first time I think I'd seen it, uh, two writers named Rennick and Harmon, and is for a group of Jewish Christians 
who continued to keep the law and rabbinic interpretations, you know, the rabbis' rules about, say, keeping the Sabbath. And the rabbis had very detailed rules about that. You know, um, what you could do and what you couldn't do, what was work and what was not work uh, on, on the Sabbath. So it's a small group. It's very Jewish. And it continues to the 4th century. <coughs> there are just a few of them, even around in the 300s. Another group is similar, but more extreme, and they were called the Ebionites. And nobody, please don't ask me why they're called that, because I didn't look it up and I can't remember. Um, but they were more extreme than the Nazarenes. But this is, they're putting a very strong Jewish interpretation on things. They rejected Paul's letters. Said, no use for Paul. Um, the gospel that they liked was, the only one they would accept was Matthew. And you know, Matthew does address himself more to the Jews. Like he's very concerned to say, this fulfills Old Testament prophecy. And uh, there are just a lot of things about Matthew that are Jewish. Um, they denied the virgin birth. Of course, you know it's not a virgin birth. The birth is like any birth. Um, it's the conception that Jesus was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit without a man. Um, when I say it's not a virgin birth, the Roman Catholics believe, or the traditional Roman Catholic belief, is that Mary remained a virgin all her life and never had any other children, uh, that Jesus was born, his birth was miraculous too. Um, she remained a virgin, even having birth, giving birth. So that was a miracle. Um, and that all those people you read about in your New Testament, you know, his brothers and sisters are here. Well, no, they must be cousins or something like that. Or maybe they're Joseph's kids from an earlier um, marriage or something like that. The Ebionites said Jesus was a man until his baptism. He was just an ordinary man, but then the Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed him in a special way. But the Spirit left him just before the cross. So it was only a, an ordinary man who died on the cross. And yet, this is kind of contradictory. It, it's all muddled. They expected that the Son of Man was going to come in glory. Doesn't seem to add up. Um, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, Rob. Not sure. The, the next group is called the Gnostics. And this is a really broad term. Uh, and think of this gnosis, think of uh, diagnostic, actually right there. Diagnostic, it's knowledge that the doctor comes up with when they look at you and get all your vital signs and ask you why your toe is hurting and so on. And then they, they go through that, uh, that knowledge to get to what's wrong with you. And so gnosis means knowledge, and that's what they stressed, special knowledge and really kind of secret knowledge. Um, it's like we've got this special inside information about God and about salvation, and other people don't know it. And you have to almost be initiated into this little group that will hold on to the secrets. Um, and some of those handouts that I handed out to you will um, uh, mention the Gnostics. And if you get into things like the Gospel of Thomas, I think I gave you a, um, a list of the uh, sayings from the Gospel of Thomas uh, that we hear about sometimes. It's all kind of mystical, airy-fairy stuff. You know, it's, it, some of them seem a little bit like our Gospels, and I left out some parts that talked about you know, the sower goes out and sows, and it's 
kind of close to what we have in our Gospels. But a lot of the sayings are, you know, finding secret knowledge that gives you eternal life. And um, it's almost like new age stuff. It really feels that, that way a lot. They took some vaguely Christian ideas and combined them with some of the mythologies of Greece, Egypt, Persia, and so on. So it's kind of a, a, a mix of philosophy and, and Christianity. And they said there were three classes of people. There were the spiritual people who were superior, and they knew all the secrets. So that's the little group. And then uh, they said there was a psychic group. And um, that doesn't mean they had ESP or anything like that, but they, they didn't just have... Uh, or they just had faith, but they didn't have the special knowledge. And then you get another group, the Hylic, which was, I th think, Hylic. And they are ordinary people. They are just on the lowest level, subject to Satan's attacks um, and uh, their lusts and so on. So they, they, it's a hierarchy. You know, you're just the ordinary person who's not at all spiritual, then maybe some who have faith, and then the ones who have the secret knowledge. Now, they said, too, that matter, like, you know, things all around us, that this is evil. Um, and salvation, then, is overcoming matter, like your body and the world. And the way to do this is through gnosis, through knowledge, and through certain disciplines. Um, like if you did a lot of fasting or you, uh, you know, deprived yourself of things. Uh, some of the monks, and they weren't necessarily Gnostics, but they had this sort of idea that if they suffered a lot, um, if they, they did things to their body, then that would purify their soul. And so, you know, you... Uh, may have, I don't know if anybody saw the, um, I think it was made into a movie, the, um, the Da Vinci Code. But, you know, the idea of taking a whip and you hit yourself, you flagellate. And um, the idea is if you do that, you're becoming more spiritual. And there's a famous man, uh, as I said, he wasn't a, a Gnostic, but he, uh, he's considered a saint, <laughs> Um, Stylites or Simeon the Stylite. And this was um, a man who was an extreme ascetic. And ascetic is the word that we use for this kind of discipline that you're doing, uh, like going without food for a long time, de um, depriving yourself of all kinds of things. Um, and what Simeon did was he uh, made this pillar, or he got a pillar, and he lived up on the top. This is Simeon. And um, he stayed up there for, forgotten whether it was 25 or 30 years. And like they just sent him his food up, you know, and uh, uh, I don't want to get into any details here. It sounds like it could be very strange. But he was an extreme ascetic. Um, but the Gnostics had this kind of idea. And so they abstained from material things. Um, and the heresy that's called uh, docetism is the idea, and it comes from a Greek word that has to do with appearing. And so it was the idea that, well, God cannot become man. God could never, the word wouldn't really become flesh and live among us because flesh is evil, right? Uh, it's material. The body is bad. Um, so then the son of God must only have appeared to be human. He seemed to be a human being, but not really. And that is because, because God couldn't come into close contact with this world. So when you read the Gospel of John, and it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, 
who is with God and was God. And then you read verse 14, it's, it's a real shocker to this kind of thinking. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There was a man who took this Gnostic view, whose name was, we're going to have to get rid of our Nazarenes here, but that's probably okay. Um, and his name was Serinthus. Uh, wait, no, it's an I. Serinthus. I got that? That look right? Um, and he lived in Ephesus. Now, we'll go to the famous map of Rob. Um, Ephesus is right here. So you've got the Mediterranean Sea, and you've got um, uh, Greece is here, Rome is over here, and Ephesus is here. It's on the Aegean Sea, the little one that goes down, and there, of course, is Jerusalem over there. So Serinthus lived in Ephesus, which is where John, the apostle, ended up. And John, of course, opposed him. And, and so again, the Gospel of John, the first letter of John, um, the word of life, we saw him, we touched him. You know, it, it's all about how real the incarnation was. That, that's very important to John. But Serinthus was one of the people who said, well, he only seemed to be human. And so John, the this, this little story, some of these little stories are not in the Bible, but they come down from I don't know where. And uh, it could be true, and it's uh, kind of cute, that John went to the public bath, because he probably didn't have a bathtub at home. So he went to the, the big swimming pool called the public bath, and um, he spotted Serinthus there. And he turned around, and he hightailed it the other way, and he was yelling, Everybody get out, get out, Serinthus is here, the roof might fall in. So um, they didn't exactly see eye to eye. Now some of these Gnostics would have very strict morals. It could go either way. It could be either that they were very moral and, you know, because they're disciplining themselves, right? Their bodies and so on. Or it could be, it could de degenerate into a very loose kind of, of living. Because you might say, well, the body's nothing. It's the spirit. It's the soul. That's what really is close to God and is going to be with God. And your body doesn't matter. So whatever you do, go out and get drunk. You can uh, fornicate, commit adultery. You can do whatever you want with your body. Doesn't matter because we're getting rid of the body anyway. And so... The teaching of the, of the Bible is, no, the resurrection of the body. Jesus took a body. Our bodies matter. And even in the life to come. Now, two of the leaders um, were, um, and I think I may have at least one quote from one of these guys. Um, better get the spelling right. Um... Now, this is not St. Valentine or anything like that. Uh, Valentinus and the other guy was Basilides. And Valentinus was in Rome about 140 AD. So he's in the second century. And um, they were Gnostics. They believed God was very remote so the problem is, how could God create matter? Like, we have a world, we have bodies. If God is so remote and has nothing to do with that, then how come we've got creation? And their answer was that there were about 30 or so intermediate beings between God and us. And um, they, they used the word emanation, if something uh, emanates, it goes out from something. So uh, it was one of these, the last one, who created the earth and human beings. And they would also say, obviously, he did a bad job. You know, he botched it. Um, and if you read 
Colossians. Colossians seems to have in the background an idea something like this, almost as though the angels are the intermediate beings and you could worship the angels and so on. And Paul is having none of that. But anyway, there was a man who came along and um, he has a lot of influence. And um, his name is Marcion. And I didn't look on the map to see where he lived, but he lived in a place called Sinope. Uh, The important thing is he died in Rome about 170. And he was of a pure life. He lived an upright life. His beliefs would be somewhat sound, orthodox, but he rejected the Old Testament. And he thought that the God revealed in the Old Testament was a lesser being, maybe a lesser God, um, an evil God, really. Part of what was going on with Marcion was he was very, very taken with Paul. His, he was just really a great follower of Paul and the idea of salvation is by grace and it's through faith. And so um, that's very different from a more Jewish idea where many of the Jews emphasized works. And so he says, forget the Old Testament because it kind of leads you, it might lead you if you read it a certain way to think in terms of works. Um, he only accepted Paul's letters and some parts, parts of the Gospels. So uh, he wants to um, completely cut Christianity off from his Hebrew roots, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I would say we still have Marcionites around today. There are lots of people who don't bother to read the Old Testament, don't think it's of any great value. Um, Sometimes, you know, you could raise the question, was it a good idea to publish the Bible, uh, you know, to publish just the New Testament as a separate thing without the Old Testament? Because if you don't have the Old Testament, you don't have the background that helps you understand a lot of the new. But we've done that, so we're going to have to live with it. But um, I have heard people say, I've heard pastors say, in some churches anyway, The God of the Old Testament was the God of wrath and judgment, but Jesus reveals the God of love and the Father, and that these are two different things. Jesus then changes the whole picture. Um, I think that's exaggerated. I think there's um, grace in the Old Testament, and I think there's judgment in the New Testament. So it's not as simple as that. But I would say there are Marcionites. Uh, We don't call them that, but they're still around. But then another group that we uh, need to know about is is a group called the Montanists. If you don't remember all this, don't worry. Uh, (laughs) It's a lot of stuff, I know. A lot of names. But um, there was a man named Montanus, and uh, he came from Mysia, so somewhere in Asia Minor. And um, his ministry goes from about 135 AD to 177. And Mysia is right here. It's kind of just above north of Ephesus. And that's where he came from, Montanus. As the church got more settled in the world, it loses a bit of its character as a movement of people who are you know, really on fire for God and they're excited about Christ and they're, it's a spiritual movement. And after a while, a kind of formalism sets in. You know, well, we're just going through the motions, we're doing the routines, and things become more rigid, less flexible, uh, maybe even frigid. And whenever that happens, and it seems to be a pattern through the centuries, that you know, almost any institution Give it 50 years or so, and it can kind of harden. And it it needs to be revived again then, or else it's going to go downhill. Um, But whenever that happens, you get a reaction. So 
uh, when you get this very formal kind of Christianity that was settle- setting in, then you get people like Montanus who come along and they're all enthusiastic and it's all about excitement and um, that was the kind of person he was. He wanted a more lively awareness of the presence of God and the power of God uh, in people's lives. And he believed the Holy Spirit, he stressed the Spirit a lot, he believed the Holy Spirit spoke direct to people. It wasn't just through the apostles or anything like that, or the prophets, but through people like Montanus. And it was was through him. So in a way, the Montanists are something like hope I don't get in trouble here, something like the charismatic movement or Pentecostals. Um, A great emphasis on the Holy Spirit, on um, a lively sense of awareness of God. Um, There would be speaking in tongues, there was prophecy, all of that kind of thing. That's Montanism. And it began in Egypt when thousands of people fled to the desert to avoid temptation or to avoid persecution. And there was a man who lived in Carthage, and Carthage, um, I don't know if this is going to tell us, but anyway, Carthage is down in, in Africa somewhere. It's right up around here somewhere. Oh, right here. There's Carthage. And this man came from that place, and his name was, um, I can't even spell it, it was, um, no, I was right, Tur Tullian. Now that is an important name, Tertullian, who came from Carthage. And he, at first, was among the Orthodox, and he actually wrote a lot of things. Many of them are very, very good, and um, they're still studied today. But in his later life, he joined the Montanists. Um, he was born um, in about 155, and he trained as a lawyer. Uh, the sect that he started died out in Africa about 370, so in the 4th century. And that was in Africa, and, and elsewhere by about the 6th century. He's the first person to use the term New Testament. And he's the first person to use the term Trinity. As I said, he's a very important man. And when I say to that Tertullian joined the Montanists in his life, the Montanists are not necessarily crazy heretics who don't believe in Jesus or don't believe in that Jesus is the Son of God who is our Savior. They've just, they're considered heretics because they go off in this direction about um, uh, new, new revelations being given, prophecies being given, and so on. Um, but I don't think that they were, you know, they wouldn't deny the Apostles' Creed or anything like that. There was another guy from, uh, Carthi- uh, from Carthage, and his name was um, Cyprian. And I've got, I think I've got a quote or two from Cyprian in the handout. Um, and he was born around 200. And he stood against Montanism. So he opposes the Montanists. Um, He's very concerned about the church and doing things properly in the church. He came from a wealthy, cultured family. He was converted at the age of 40. And he took the words of Jesus literally about selling everything you have and giving to the poor. And this is something that happens with some of these fathers is sometimes they read these words of Christ and aren't thinking of the context of, well, maybe this was being said to a a man who was so focused on his wealth, and they just went out and sold everything they had, and maybe he needed to, I don't know. Uh, But he gave it all away to the poor. Two years after he was baptized, he was ordained as a presbyter. Remember I said presbyter means elder, and it would be... um, we would say maybe a minister or a pastor today. And soon after that, he became a bishop. So uh, he, he moves up the ladder pretty fast. Montanus 
um, told people to abstain from marriage. Um, he said, men and women should just leave each other alone, go off in separate directions, forget about this marriage thing. And um, if you are married already, well, we'll dissolve that marriage. And you, you, you part. Um, usually that's the formula for your movement dying out in the first generation. Um, not a good idea. But Cyprian exalts the ministers of the presbyters to become priests. Now, in the English word for priest is really just a short form, a contraction of presbyter. It's very confusing because um, we don't use the Old Testament term for a priest who's offering sacrifices. No, we have elders or um, pastors in the church today who do not offer a sacrifice. But what has happened is over the years, especially say in the Roman Catholic Church, is the idea, they sort of took the Old Testament idea of a priest and applied it to the presbyter so that Christ is offered up in the Mass as a sacrifice. Um, that's a doctrine that comes up later. Now, the Apostles' Creed, some churches say this frequently, um, and I'm sure that you know it. Um, you know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So you know that. Um, it doesn't go back to the apostles themselves. It doesn't go back to the 12 disciples or anything like that. But it goes back to pretty early, in a way, the, 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 there's a shorter form of it maybe, uh, that was called the Old Roman Creed. And then they added a bit to it and they got the apostles. And then later there are other creeds. And the whole idea of the Apostles' Creed was because they needed a simple statement of faith. When people were being baptized, they wanted them to affirm their faith. And so they would say this, this creed. Um, there was a man whose name was Irenaeus. Sorry, which? You mean Cyprian? Uh, no, um, it's it's maybe a little. A, it's a bit later, I think, than than his time. But probably this old Roman creed was used in his day. Um, but this fellow here, Irenaeus, he was a disciple of Polycarp, and if you were here last week. I think I mentioned that Polycarp was the old man. When he was 86 years old, he was burned at the stake for his faith. He would not deny Christ. And Polycarp knew John the Apostle. So he was a student of John. John was a disciple of Jesus. So you see the, how close he would be uh, to Jesus. He lived in Lyon, in Gaul. And that's what this is. Um, this map says Gallia. Uh, it's France today. And Lyon, I've forgotten. Anyway, it's over there somewhere. Um, he lived there and he was a bishop around 177. He wrote a very famous book called Against Heresies. And he laid a lot of the groundwork for the doctrine of the Trinity. He really stressed the one God. And one of the first people to really think a lot about the person of Jesus and uh, you know, who he was and what he had done. And he appealed to other uh, pastors, bishops who'd come before him, who'd received the message, again, going back to the apostles who knew Christ. And he applied, uh, compiled a, a list of these bishops because it was very important you know, to say, who are the orthodox and who are the heretics? So if you had a list saying, okay, um, the pa my pastor is so-and-so, and he uh, was mentored by this guy, who was mentored by that guy, who knew Polycarp, who knew John, then you sort of got this chain, and you can say, we're pretty sure that we're standing in the right line. And from that, you get this idea of apostolic succession. And 
in the Catholic Church and in Anglican churches and some others, they really lay a lot of stress on this. Not so much uh, the idea of the doctrine. I guess they assume this, that the doctrine has come down uh, intact, going right back to the apostles. But they almost make it a mechanical thing so that if you are... Um, ordained as a minister in the Anglican Church, it will be by a bishop. But that bishop has to have been properly ordained by other bishops, from other bishops, and they believe there's an unbroken line back to the apostles. Uh, But it becomes almost a thing of like, just very external. If the laying on of hands was given by this, the right person, then you're okay. And that seems very superficial. I mean, if you go back and think about some of the people who were bishops and popes and so on, some of them were rotten. They were nasty. They were cruel. Uh, there's a whole group of people called the bad popes. And um, you know, with all their mistresses and the whole bit. And some of them were, were off base in some of their beliefs. So but they would say, oh, that doesn't matter. What really matters is they had the laying on of hands from the right people. So um, back in the actual time of the New Testament, the church was organized and governed in a way that was, I, th- I think, probably somewhat flexible. Um, it's amazing how quickly it kind of became rigid. Uh, in about half a century, you get this very um, stratified idea of you know the deacon, and then the presbyter, and then the bishop, and all of that. Um, by the time of Clement in the third century, the transition has been made from uh, elders, uh, you know, having many elders in a church or presbyters, getting down to one presbyter who's kind of over the others, and that's a bishop in the more modern sense. And they lay a lot of stress on the bishop, or um, episcopate. Um, if you, there's a, a church in the U.S. that's called the Episcopal Church, and Anybody know what the Episcopal Church is? We've got it in Canada, but they just don't use that name much. It's the Anglican Church. Um, so the Episcopate means the, 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 the bishops. And Clement stresses that a lot. Um, traditions that were supposed to come from the apostles or were passed down to the bishop. Um, Eventually, and there are all kinds of traditions, some of them are good, some of them are not, but tradition after a while becomes equal to Scripture. Certainly in the Roman Catholic Church, they believe the Bible is the Word of God, but they believe the traditions that have come down are equally uh, valid. And uh, so, you know, you might say, well, where does it say in the Bible that Mary... um, that her mother um, conceived her without any sin, which is called the Immaculate Conception. Protestants think Immaculate Conception means the virgin birth, but it doesn't. It means that Mary's mother did not have the taint of original sin to pass on to her. Of course, it just raises the question, well, then what about her mother and her mother? You know, but the thing is, um, you don't read that in the Bible. There's no, where it says that Mary was taken up into heaven. That's the assumption. Somebody said it's quite an assumption. Harvey? That that particular thing is celebrated in Cornet. Is it the Immaculate Conception? 3,000 Because it's all about St. Anne, right? Who's the mother, supposedly, of Mary. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't find that in the Bible. That's in tradition. That's traditions that have come down, and again, you'd have to sift through the traditions to say which ones is there evidence for, 
which ones are just s what somebody came up with somewhere. Anyway, just coming around uh, quickly, um, there was uh, an emperor whose name was um, Decius, and this is around 250, AD 250, that he began a persecution of the Christians, which was the worst of all. The Decian persecution is the worst. And what it did was it sifted out those who were really, really committed and those who were not. Uh, those whose Christianity was only nominal. But you know, you go back, I was reading something the other day about some of the tortures they put people through and so on. And you, know, you read that and you say, I don't know, if I lived back then, would I be a compromiser? Would I have... You know, I mean, all he had to do maybe was sprinkle a little incense in front of Caesar's bust and say, oh, Caesar is Lord or something. And Christians, some were very conscientious and said, no, can't do that. They often died. And some headed for the hills and some compromised and collaborated. I mean, it happens all down through, the, through history. The Germans invade France. What do you get? You get a resistance movement, but you get the collaborators. You know, it's always that way. And, um, but there were, I mean, it was, it was terrible what they did to people. Then there was a guy named Novatus. And uh, he is a bishop. And... He says, the people who compromised, the people who denied Christ to save their skin, um, well, okay, the persecution's over now. They say they repent. We should bring them back into the church. So no Novatus takes a kind of, what do we want to call that, merciful or lax or whatever view of the discipline of the church. Another guy whose name is similar, uh, would be easy to confuse them. His name was Novation. Novation is a rival bishop at Rome and he had takes the opposite view. He takes a view of extreme strictness with those lapsed people who compromised. Uh, he wanted a pure church. We don't want compromisers. We want those who are really committed to Christ. And so, um, no, we're not going to welcome them back. Cyprian, back to him, took a different view. He favored readmitting the lapsed after they showed a lot of, you know, some real evidence of remorse and repentance. So maybe it's a, a halfway view. And of course, it's still a question in a way. Um, the whole question of church discipline and how do you deal with scandalous sin? I mean, think of all these um, news reports we've had over the last, what, 20 years or more, especially of this famous evangelist, this TV preacher, this pastor, you know, runs off and has an affair with some woman and, or maybe has dipping into the collection plate or whatever, and you've got a scandal, and what do you do? Um, do you say, well, let's forgive them. They say they're sorry, we'll forgive them, and put them back in leadership. And some people have been put back in leadership pretty fast. Or do you say, no, um, they had their chance and they blew it, never going to be a pastor again. Or do you say, well, we'll send them off for a lot of counseling and rehabilitation, and after a period of testing or whatever, maybe we, we welcome them back. Those are the kind of questions that are still with us. So it, it's not that this was some weird thing that only happened back then. Um, these are things that, that keep coming up. Cyprian made a lot of claims for the office of the bishop. He said the bishop has authority right from God. He also promoted a concept of priests sacrificing on altars. 
again, he goes back almost to an Old Testament priesthood. And as I said, I think Catholicism um, picks up some of this and confuses Old Testament and New. I went up to Lourdes Church one day and was just wandering around looking to give somebody a poster to advertise some event. And I saw this plaque on the wall in memory of one of the priests. And um, it quoted a verse of scripture from the book of Hebrews, which says, um, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, wait a minute, that's got nothing to do with Roman Catholic pastors today. It's actually a reference to Christ himself, right? He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a different order. And, um, but they've taken this Old Testament thing and applied it to their priests. Um, but in the, the, the word, and I'll just put this word up just so you can see it anyway. Um, the, um, you're going to end up getting a crash course in Greek or something, I guess. Um, whether you want it or not. So this word, hierus, means a sacrificing priest. If you were reading the, a Greek translation of the Old Testament and you come across this word, it is something like the Levitical priests are offering animals to be sacrificed. When you read the New Testament, though, you do not ever see this word applied to um, a leader in the church. The, uh, the word that is used there is presbyteros, which we said means an elder. Um, and priest, our English word priest, as I said before, is a shortened form of this word. It's not this word at all. So that's been muddled by some. Um, and I think I mentioned last week too that when Paul is talking to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, he calls the elders together. He calls the presbyteroi, the presbyters, the elders. But when he's talking to them, he calls them episkopoi, which is bishop. He says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of the flock. And the thing there is that the word elder refers to the position, you might say, the, the office, the position. Bishop or overseer has to do with the function. So if you're a presbyter, an elder, a leader, you exercise oversight. That's your job. In the Baptist church, it, you're called a deacon. It's all the same thing. Um, up until that time, up until the time of Cyprian, the church used to boast to the pagans that it had no altar and no sacrifice. So the pagans were offering up animals, and the Christians say, we don't do that. We don't have an altar. We're just offering sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. But Cyprian changes that. He brings in this idea of a sacrificing priesthood. Um, there was a bishop, Stephen, in Rome, and he wanted to be a pope, I guess. He called all the churches to submit to his authority, around 256. And Cyprian says, no, I refuse to bow to you. I'm, I'm equal to you in my, my area. Um, he was a very strong-willed guy and must have had a little bit of an ego. Uh, Cyprian ends, though, by being beheaded 40 miles outside Carthage during the persecution of another emperor, um, Valerius. Now, another guy who's important is, this is guy is actually very important. His name is Origen, and um, he's a very important father in the early church. One of the great thinkers of all time, 
Christian thinkers and writers. He wrote a famous book, which is called Against Celsius. Or, or not, not, I don't mean, sorry, not Celsius. He had nothing to, he didn't care about the thermometer. It was Celsius. And there's a, the Latin title of his book is Contra Celsum. This Celsus was uh, a pagan who lived a hundred years or so before Origen, and he wrote a lot of things, or he criticized the, the Christian faith. And he was sort of influential, so Origen thought, I've got to answer him. So we don't have Celsus' book anymore. We don't know what he, all that he said. The only thing we can do is sort of put together fragments of what he probably said from what Origen says when he quotes him and then uh, 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 disagrees with him. And Origen uh, had a lot of good things to say about the Trinity and, and all of that, but he had some quirks too. For example, he was a universalist. He believed that eventually all people would be saved. I guess that after death, you would be given further opportunities to repent. He even believed the devil would ultimately be saved, which is a little offbeat. He also took some of the gospel uh, literally, um, where Jesus talked about uh, those who have been made eunuchs or those who have made themselves eunuchs, and he went and he literally followed that and um, emasculated himself. Um, which was an unfortunate literal interpretation. Um, there is an idea that um, when we talk about the Trinity, um, that some people stress the unity of the Godhead so much, the oneness of God, that they don't emphasize the persons. And so um, they would say, it's not like you have... Um, it's not like you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as, you know, distinct, um, but still all God. Um, they would say, no, it's just that God the Father, when he reveals himself at a certain point, he reveals himself as the son, or it's like he takes the role of the son. And then at a later point, he takes the role of the Holy Spirit. And this was a view of a monk whose name was Sabellius. And um, so um, that is a view that is still around today. In fact, I believe, I've never been able to really nail this down or find out exactly what they believe, um, but there's a group on the way to Petawawa called the Emmanuel Lighthouse, and they're United Pentecostals. They're not Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. That's the Orthodox traditional group. The United Pentecostals, uh, sometimes called the Jesus-only group, and they believe in what they call oneness. And so they would say, there's just the one person, and they say it's Jesus. Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Well, that goes back to those early days of the church. There were people who thought something like that. Sibelius would be one of them. And then another guy uh, who is uh, very famous, and we still have some of his ideas around today, was a man named Arius. I can't even spell. Arius. And he came from Alexandria, and it's about 318 that he starts his work. So Alexandria is down here in Egypt. So you see, it's all around the Mediterranean Sea. So Alexandria is here. And Arius is a presbyter from there who begins to, begins to teach what he thought or people might have thought was a middle view of who Jesus is. Neither a mere man, not just an ordinary man, 
but not equal to the Father. He wants to have a middle view. And so he says that the Father, the Father existed from all eternity. But at a certain point, he created the Son. And then you get the Holy Spirit coming later. And so that a famous quote from Arius is about Jesus. Once he was not. Well, that's it. Once he was not. There was a time when he was not. Whereas we would say there never was a time when he was not. He always existed. Um, So he becomes a kind of second God alongside the Father, which is a little weird because the Bible's very clear there's only one God. Can anybody, does anybody know what group we might have today that would kind of keep the Arius view going? You know who teaches this? That Jesus is a sort of created being? Jehovah's Witnesses. They all seem to want to cluster on the way to Petawawa, all these heretics, you see. No. Um, The New World Translation, they have their own translation of the Bible. And in John 1, it starts off by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, with a small g. So in other words, they believe that there are two gods. There's God, Jehovah, and then there's this second God, like an angel or something. In fact, they sometimes say it's really the angel Michael. But that does away with the Trinity, and it actually produces a belief in many gods, polytheism. And um, now the Trinity, of course, still perplexes Christians, and we discuss these things and debate them back and forth. Some people, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Unitarians, many liberal Protestants and Mainline churches don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, Some people come up with theories about how the persons relate. And, you know, it's okay to try to think about it. And if you've got a theory, well, we can talk about it. Um, I think the thing is some Christians incline towards stressing the oneness of God. The danger there is you lose sight of the distinct persons. Person isn't the the best word. We don't know what word to use. I think somebody said, we use this word because we don't know what other word to use. Um, So some people emphasize the oneness, like those United Pentecostals. There's one God. He just reveals himself in different ways. Some people emphasize the threeness, and they they think very of, of the Father, the Son, the Spirit is very distinct, And maybe they tend to focus on one particular person. As evangelical Christians, I think our tendency probably is to focus on the Son. You know, we talk about Jesus. Um, Some people, it just seems like they only talk about Jesus. And the Father kind of gets forgotten. Um, The Pentecostals, it's all about the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of hard to hold it together. We, we, we tend to want to go off one way or the other. But the orthodox view that the church has held from early times is there is one God eternally existing as three centers of consciousness, three persons, whatever term you want to use. And that's foundational because each plays a part in the drama of redemption. And they work in harmony as one God. Unless Christ is God as well as man, we have no Savior. Because the suffering and death of a mere man wouldn't have the infinite value that we need to pay for our sins. Unless the Spirit is God, then there will be no work of God within us to create and sustain faith and repentance and lead us forward in growth toward godliness. So I would just close with The famous um, saying, and I don't know how far back this goes, but it's a kind of prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, which means forever. Amen.